Uh, so I want to pray for Ted as he preaches. I want to pray for us that we'd receive the word that uh, God's given him this morning for us. Lord God, thank you for uh, Ted. We, we're grateful, Lord, that you uh, have placed him and his wife uh, in our lives as a church. Uh, we really, um, it's something I never want to take for granted, God, just the, the, um, just the life, the testimony that you've uh, built in him and his wife's uh, lives. And uh, God, it's just a great honor and, and privilege for us to uh, sit here and, and hear the word uh, be preached from him as he's given so much uh, time and thought and prayer and passion and his actual uh, demonstration uh, in this particular um, uh, topic of, of the kingdom of God. Uh, and so God, I pray for our ears that we would be, uh, have ears to hear, uh, that we'd have uh, hearts that would believe this morning. Uh, as he brings us the truth of your word in uh, speaking to us about what this kingdom of God is and how it relates to us as a church. So Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love your pastor. I love the time when he was over in uh, Zambia, but I also especially love the times when I'm here. We make it a point to get together almost every week and have a time of fellowship and uh, just interaction, have a good time. As you know, I'm sure Joby is also a lot of fun. So we get together and really just enjoy sharing life together, sharing word. We share uh, theology. Uh, we were going back and forth last night with a couple of, yesterday with a couple of questions and we're messaging and I, I'm not too sure of all the protocol and all this stuff on the, the messaging on Facebook, but I, we were kind of going and it was getting longer and longer and longer and I'm thinking now, are we supposed to switch to email and not just keep going on the, Facebook, and then I abruptly remembered I had, to, he asked me this long list of questions, and then he said, what do you think, do you agree? And I just said yes, and left, and he went, what happened? Just <laughs> dropped out in the middle, I said, I gotta go, I'm supposed to be going off somewhere. So I love the, the interaction and love the dialogue. Um, as Joe B said, when he asked me if I would come and preach, and he, he said, uh, you know, you can preach on whatever, or I have this subject that, uh, you know, will fit in in terms of our overall message for what I'm preaching through Matthew, and it has to do with the kingdom of God. Will you, would you like to do that? And he said, I just lit up. I was about 38 years old, uh, maybe a little younger. I was in my senior year of, se or my third year of seminary before I even heard of any message given in the church related to the kingdom of God. All my history growing up in the church, never heard a message about the kingdom. I heard about the gospel, you know, naturally, but never about the kingdom of God. And then as I researched and I was doing a study on the kingdom of God in seminary, it's the central message of the New Testament and uh, Old Testament throughout the, the whole scripture. Uh, but we have become truncated in, in kind of narrowing down the gospel most of the time related to the message of salvation. But Jesus came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. So this morning I want to begin by, if you want to look in your Bibles, I want to look at Psalm 145. I was in Brazil a few years ago, a good friend of mine uh, that I went to seminary with, he invited me to come and bring a, a team to do an outreach to what was uh, called the Feast of Imaja Festival. Uh, Brazil is uh, embedded along with Christianity. There's a great deal of spiritism that uh, is in the culture, even in highest forms of government. And one of the feasts they have there annually is the Feast of Imaja. And when I went to the uh, beach town where this feast was celebrated to do an outreach with uh, Pastor Paulo, I was just overwhelmed by what I saw. It was a huge, huge statue of uh, what would look like the, the Virgin Mary from the Catholic Church, all dressed in blue, probably about 30 feet high. And people were rolling around in the beach with pacifiers in their mouth, adults. And I said to my friend Paul, I said, what, what is going on? What happened? He said, oh, they're trying to conjure up what they think is the good spirits because this is the Feast of Imaja. You get this blessing from Ima. <laughs> so, we went further and then they were having these sections where people were dancing around and women blowing cigars and uh, putting blessings, they said, on people. And they had altars with 
St. Christopher and, uh, you know, all type of voodoo statues and stuff like that. And as I was going further and further into the crowd and seeing these things, I was literally becoming sick and feeling overwhelmed. And so I said, oh, Paulo, where can I go? He said, well, there's a prayer room over there. And as I began to pray with this overwhelming sense of evil, the Lord led me to this psalm, which I think is really a summation of the reality about the kingdom and what we are to be about as believers as we are in the world and facing the reality and the challenges of this world and even the God of this age, we have to be reminded and consistently in touch with that we have come to preach the kingdom of God and declare the mighty acts of God. So Psalm 145 says, I will extol you, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Here's the key verse. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. One generation will commend your works to another. So my question this morning to all of us is in terms of our generation today, are we declaring and speaking of the, uh, commending the works of God and the mighty acts of God to the world around us and even to other believers? Are we commending? They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. What awesome works has God done in your life lately? And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, we can say, salvation is the most awesome work that he has done in our life. But how often are we going about proclaiming and declaring and saying, man, this is what God is doing as I engage with him and I, I interact with the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life and, and he begins to lead me and guide me and direct me and, and cause me to come outside of my comfort zone that I can be able to say to people, wow, God is doing this, God is doing that. I am weak, I don't have the resources to do what God is calling me to do, but yet God is alive, God is well, he is powerful and he's acting in and through his people. That's what we're to be about. We're not a people that are passive, say, listeners to the word of God and be able to say to people, look how much knowledge I have. We have to have the word, but we also have to have power as well, proclamation and, pre and demonstration so that people will be able to not only hear, but see the reality of the kingdom as we are engaged with the world. And as you're going through the scripture here this morning, uh, uh, through the next year or so, maybe two, as you're going through the scripture, Joby told me two and a half years, I said, wow, that reminds me of my first time when I started, when I started pastoring. I got up and I preached through the gospel of John, it took me a year and a half. And then somebody left the church, told me I wasn't in the words, go figure that out. So, <laughs> so he says, I, they will speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and sing joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures forever. The message of the kingdom is critical for us as Christians to get a hold of and to grasp. And, and once we do, it, it will ignite something in us that will enable us to have not only a better understanding, but a better ability to move into whatever God may be calling us to do on our daily living basis or some focus or redirection in our life. The gospel of the kingdom is the central message of the gospel. We see here in Psalm 145, it's, it's there. It's not something that just all of a sudden burst forth in the New Testament. It did burst forth in terms of the uh, Jesus coming by way of the incarnation and 
the age to come breaking in in terms of his person into our reality, the word becoming flesh. But at the same time, the, the message is rooted in the Old Testament. Exodus 15, 18 says, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. It is grounded in the confidence that there is an eternal living God who has revealed himself to men and women who has a purpose for the human race, which he has tro chosen to manifest through Israel and now through the church, the true Israel. So there, there is this theme woven through scripture that comes when John comes on the scene after over 400 years of no prophetic pronouncement and then he comes on with this message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There, there's all of a sudden an, an escalation of things that were what seemed to be, in terms of our understanding, dormant. It's Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So it's rooted, it's there in the Old Testament, but it's also the message of the New Testament. The declaration of John the Baptist, as we said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. It's the message of Jesus. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news and healing every disease and sickness among people. So Jesus proclaimed and he did as he brought the reality of the kingdom into, into this age in which we live in. Mark 1, 14 and 15, it says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time had come, he said, and the kingdom of God is, is near. Repent and believe the good news. It's important to understand when we talk about the kingdom of God, it is God's kingdom, not our kingdom. And I think this is the confusion where we're at somewhat in the, in the overall church today in many parts of the world. We are looking at explaining God and how we are dealing with the issues of life by having it that God is formed in our image instead of we are formed in his image. So we look through a, a, a humanistic lens instead of a theological lens, so much so today that people are totally rejecting any sense that God is a God of love and mercy, but there's also the wrath of God that has been propitiated because of the work of Christ on the cross. And I was reading something at Easter time in, on a Facebook thing, and some guy said, well, that's, that's not a God of love who would allow his son to be punished for sins. He absorbed our sin. I say he did a little bit more than absorb our sin. He took the punishment for our sin so that you and I would not have to receive the punishment that was due us, but the love of Christ was able to make an offering which would require, was required for sin. So it's God's kingdom. And he gives a definition. Man's definition is according to worldly standards. And it has to do oftentimes with the self. I believe that's why we're so absorbed today with a theology of comfort rather than a theology of obedience. To do whatever God is calling you to do wherever you are. I've had parents tell me, oh, I pray that my children will never be sent to the mission field. And I said, that you pray that your kids will never be, why? Because they will lose so much of what they have here in America. And I said, well, God could send them to Beverly Hills. I said, I would rather be sent to the mission field in Africa to Beverly Hills. You know, to me, that's like an overwhelming mission field and what I'm not in touch with by way of lifestyle. So it's this, this sense of, Self, self-comfort, what, what, what is it going to get me? How is the gospel going to benefit me? What is the gospel going to give me? How am I going to prosper? And if I prosper according to my worldly standards, then God has met my definition of what his rule, his oversight, and his authority is all about. And we, we've tended to twist the gospel of the kingdom to be incorporating more of the gospel of self and, and a self-realization, getting in touch with that person inside. It's all within you. Once you get in touch with that person inside you, the new age extreme goes to, then you will get in touch with that God within you and you will be totally in control of your own destiny and your own uh, experience in life. It's nothing further, further from the truth as far as the, the gospel is concerned. As we looked in Psalm 145, the gospel of the kingdom of God has to do with his glory, with his power, with his mighty acts. 
with his majesty and it's everlasting. Now, as you read through Matthew, you'll see that he refers to the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if Pastor Joby's already addressed this, but this, this synonym in Matthew is the same that's in Mark. It's really referring to the kingdom of God. There's some disagreement on this on some authors, but my understanding is that it's a synonym because of the Jewish people not using the word God explicitly, that that would have been uh, blasphemous to say God, so they substituted the word heaven. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the thing that's interesting in scripture, and that, that's so exciting, there's, there's this tension where we have the previous age and we have the age to come, and then Jesus enters into our age so that in his coming, as he said, the, the reality of the kingdom is present, but it's the presence of the future in a sense. And that's where I think some people get mixed up. I believe the Lord heals today. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in all the things that he commissioned us to do in the Old Testament, in the, in, in the commissioning in Max, Matthew 28, that we can go into all the world, Mark 16, and we can do so empowered by the Holy Spirit to pray for the sick, cast out demons, do whatever he calls us to do. But we can't control what we're, what's to be done. In other words, there's people who will say, oh, you, you know, there's no sickness today. Hey, what do you mean there's no sickness? Well, the kingdom has come. There's a theology now very prevalent in the church with a group that uses the, our Father as a model that says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we as the believers are to bring the reality of the kingdom. So when we go and pray for people, and we, Joby's got a bad back, I've run out today, I've prayed for Joby, I say, be healed in the name of Jesus. I go back to my church. What happened today? Oh, I prayed for a guy. He got healed. And then you find out a little bit further in the investigation. Go visit Joby. How are you doing? My back is killing me. And I thought you were healed. Oh, you talk to them. No, it's done on earth as it is in heaven. Once you declare it, it's done. So it's this decree and declare stuff that has to do with a lot more with positive confession, which is an old teaching that's out of the the 70s and 80s that resurfaced by way of this uh, declaration. So it, there's a present reality in terms of the kingdom to come. Jesus healed a, de a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And as he did, the Pharisees accused him of doing the work he did under the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus' response was, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, he rebuked them for saying that. He says, the kingdom of God is upon you. It's interesting so much in other parts of the world, but also in the United States, as we've ministered at times, and I go to Brazil, uh, used to every year, now I'm started up again, and other parts of the world, this whole thing of dealing with the, the reality of the demonic is real. And, and people are, are engaged in, in a lot of demonic activity, giving themselves over. And the whole idea of, of people being delivered and set free from demonic oppression is the norm. <laughs> it's, it's not supposed to be something that's unusual, but in our culture in America, we don't have demons and all that stuff. You know, they're all in Africa, they're all in Brazil, right? <laughs> At least that's, what, that's what, what people like to think. But we have large strongholds here that, that grip people's minds and altars that people worship, worship at that are different kinds of de demonic presences that, that put people in bondage and people need to be set free. So Jesus is talking about casting out uh, the demon and then the, this person is healed of blindness and, and deafness. In Luke 17, 20 and 21, in response to the question, of the Pharisees concerning when the kingdom was coming, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, it's within you. Now, some uh, people have taken that to an extreme theologically and have taught a theology. It's realized eschatology, meaning the end times have come, and the kingdom of God is within you, so there's nothing future. <laughs> and that's not what the Bible's talking about either. Colossians 1.13 says, we have already entered the kingdom, for he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So in a, in a sense, the kingdom has come 
with the coming of Jesus and his proclamation and his demonstration. But the kingdom is also a future reality. 1 Corinthians 15.50 says, Flesh and blood cannot enter it, but the perishable must put on the imperishable, the mortal, the immortal. In Matthew 25.34 it says, and he's talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats. He says, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So there is a future inheritance as well as what we're experiencing now. And then if you read through Revelation 20, there's all a description of the millennial kingdom that's coming and then culminating in Revelation 21 about the new Jerusalem where there'll be no more crying, no more pain because everything has been consummated, if you will. So as we look at this, this tension, there's this, this already but not yet. And I like one time somebody said in terms of ministering and even praying with people. I've ministered and seen tremendous healings and people being set free. And it's just like you pray and God just moves immediately. Then there's other, been other times I've ministered and prayed with people and it's like, what happened? <laughs> it's just, you know, and you can't direct and you can't control because there is an ebb and flow, if you will, in the kingdom of God. And because we're in California and with the ocean near us, it's, it's a word picture, I think, that we can all grasp. But it's kind of like when a surfer is out near the bridge at Oceanside, or where do they go down here when they're, they're surfing? He's over at Oceanside. And, and they're sitting there and they're wait, waiting for that wave. And there's kind of a lull. But it's knowing when to catch the wave and then when you catch the wave, you go with it. And sometimes there's a big wave and there's exhilarating. And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. The reality, there's an outpouring. There's a, there's a, a, a coming of the spirit in terms of ministering that is not controlled by us. That we go with what the spirit of God is doing. Jesus only did what he saw the father doing. And we have to learn as a people to get in touch with what God is doing and not try to be presumptuous, but not to fall back in a way to think that we just have no ability to be able to uh, pray and minister and expect that God is going to move and God is going to do something. So in the coming of Jesus, there's the blessing of the age to come that we mentioned in Revelation 1, uh, 5. And it's the presence of God in our time and the work of God himself in the activity of the Holy Spirit. So this age is going on and God has made it possible to experience the power of the kingdom age, but it isn't totally consummated. That's the big difference. There's fulfillment. The time is fulfilled. Jesus has come. The kingdom is here. But we don't have the total consummation because we're still living in a world that is gripped by the, the God of this age, by the permission of, of God himself, until he brings about the consummation of all things. So in the meantime, we obediently do what God has called us to do with, with expectation. I prayed for a woman who's had when, uh, cancer and she's been healed and then I can pray for somebody two weeks later and they got a headache and the stupid headache won't go. I kind of go, what happened? <laughs> More, and, I, it, and it's not, some people think you have to have more faith for like cancer than you do headaches. But it's the same thing. It's faith to trust Jesus, to be obedient, to pray, and leave the results up to him. I used to be concerned when I pray with people, but what if they don't get healed? God's not going to look good. But the reality was, I wasn't really worried about how God was going to look. It's how I was going to look. That they didn't get prayed, oh, you talk about God healed, somebody didn't get healed. We're to be obedient and, and, and move into, how, how many of you when you witness to people or share the gospel, do you stop witnessing because when you shared the gospel, the person didn't respond to the gospel? You keep witnessing because that's what you're to do. We keep doing the works of the kingdom. Salvation is, is a Greek word or Hebrew word that's all inclusive. And it doesn't mean just a single time event of regeneration and justification and that's it. It's an all exclusive concept that, that really speaks of the kingdom of God that has to do with his blessing. You're going to be looking at uh, kingdom ethics in a few weeks as you go through the beatitude. Relationships are important in the, in the, in the community 
of, of God and how we interact with one another and forgiving and preferring and loving and all those things that go along with the kingdom that, that are to be embraced by us but not only embraced as a theological construct that we're living them out on a, on a daily basis. So in the coming of Jesus, the kingdom has come with his blessing. Now John had a little bit of a problem. John, he saw that Jesus, John was in prison, and he saw that Jesus was going around proclaiming the kingdom of God, and he was getting a little bit annoyed because he was seeing him hanging out with sinners and everything else and people getting healed. And John said, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Because John was expecting the Davidic kingdom. Uh, he was thinking that Jesus was going to come, get away with the Roman rule, and it's all going to be set. We're going to take over and we're in charge. But God had something else in mind in the coming of Jesus. The mission of Jesus, when John asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we? The response looked to someone else. John responded with, uh, the response of Jesus, they, he said, go back to John and tell him what you see and what you hear. Proclamation and demonstration. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So this was Jesus' explanation to John as to what was going on. Now in, in Luke chapter 4, there's the the commissioning in a sense if you will of Jesus where he's in the synagogue and if you're there in your Bibles you can look with me there as well Luke chapter 4 in fulfillment of the, the prophet Isaiah Luke chapter 4 verse 18 he stood up in the synagogue and he read this passage from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. So Jesus in his mission especially in terms of his humanity, was not only in touch with the Father, only doing what the Father was calling him to do, he was in operating with the Holy Spirit in terms of the anointing and power to be able to do what he was called to do in terms of his, his earthly mission. He came to preach and heal, and he came to cast out demons, and in Acts 10.38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Do we believe today that people are uh, bound by the power of the devil? You know, there, there was a lot of mock, there's been a lot of mocking going on recently about uh, the talk about evil in the world today. And I think even uh, Pope Francis had uh, put out some statement about the power of the devil today and of course the media went nuts thinking oh people believe in the devil today. So there's an attempt in our culture to minimize the reality of evil and the power of the evil one. The, the evil one is real. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But we, we, we are the one that are coming in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the message. Yes, we will have opposition. Yes, we can have difficulty. But the gates of hell will not prevail against what God has ordained to do. Even if we lose our lives in the process. The people who are losing their lives, that woman who is eight months pregnant, is it Iran or Iraq? Did you, Iran? Sudan. Sudan. Eight months pregnant because she converted to Christianity and they've sentenced her to death. And they're going to let her, all mercy and compassion, they're going to let her have the baby. And then after she has the baby, they're going to take her and they're going to flog her a hundred times and then they're going to hang her in the public square because she has refused to recant her Christian faith. All because she married a Christian man. And because she married a Christian man, she's considered an adulteress because that is not a recognized marriage, so her sentence is death. But even in that death, who knows what victory God is going to bring about. Look at the early church. The early church went singing in the, in the Colosseums to their death as they were at the same time waiting with expectation of the, of the return of Christ. 
So our vision sometimes gets to be tunnel vision. We're dealing with real evil. We're dealing with real spiritual encounters that require that we have an understanding of biblically as to what the kingdom of God is about and what our role is and what our expectations can be in terms of the warfare that is going on. Because there are still spiritual warfare going on. And you and I, as brothers and sisters, we have not been called to be an audience. Jesus didn't say, come and sit and soak. He said, go and tell. So as we're, 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 we're coming together and we're being encouraged by the word and we're being built up by the word, we, we, we need to see ourselves, as I know Pastor Joby does, as a word church, but also a power church. If you have all word and no power, you can have orthodoxy that can become dead after a while. And people can become intellectual Pharisees if they're not careful. And then you can have all power and no word and people become extremists in terms of experience and then wind up in all kinds of aberrations and even heresies that's happening today. So there's a, a healthy marriage between the two that doesn't deny either one and that's why you have pastoral oversight and believe me, it isn't easy for a pastor to walk that line sometimes because you, you, you're, you're trying to be true to the word and, and, and allow things to, in terms of ministry and, and checking it against the word, but you don't want to be one that's going to uh, quench the spirit as we're exhorted against in, I believe it's Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. So this, this gospel of the kingdom is one that has to do with proclamation and, and demonstration. So Jesus had this mission. He came, see, I have to say this because Joby will just make me feel good. But it was the eschatological inbreaking of the incarnational Christ. Oh, did you feel that? <laughs> my, my Pentecostals would call that Holy Ghost goosebumps. <laughs> But it, it, it's him coming into the reality of this age. It's, it, it, it's huge. It's more than just this, our salvation. He was on a mission from God. And in coming in that mission, he fulfilled his. And then he says, see you later, guys. I'm going back to my father. Now you're going to take charge. And what did he do? He left the Holy Spirit. But the problem sometimes, the church leaves the Holy Spirit out of the picture and out of the church. And, and we can't do what God calls, we can't even effectively preach the gospel without the Holy Spirit being able to use us in terms of our, our preaching. Or else you become a good lecturer. And people can, can have a good following and say, wow, isn't that person a good speaker? But we want more, more than just good speakers. We want the word as it's preached also that the Spirit of God would be, uh, we would be open to receive him as he moves upon us in response to the word. So Jesus had his mission, proclamation and demonstration. And we have our mission. If you go through a, a survey of these scriptures that I've left in Luke 9, 1 to 9, Jesus is sending out the, uh, the 12. And he's commissioning him to go out and he says, when you go, let's look there since we're in chapter 4. I think I got a couple more minutes, right, Joby? Yep. Luke chapter when Jesus had called the twelve, chapter 9, verse 1, together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What did he do? Proclamation and demonstration. There needs to be something connected with the gospel in the church's activity in the world that speaks of the compassion of God. Whether it's healing by way of, of people who are sick or it's, or it's healing for people who are emotionally wounded or it's healing for people who have the devastating effect of the destruction of their lives by way of fire. And we sit back in a church and say, oh, isn't that too bad? When we know a brother and sister somewhere has just had the, their whole life pulled out from among them. And we say, oh, but we preach the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God has to be expressed through relationship, even by way of sacrifice sometimes on our part for those who have lost everything, that we don't just sit in our comfort and say, boy, by the grace of God, it didn't affect me. It does affect us. It affects us every time our brother and sister goes through a trial. And the world is watching as to how we respond. Are we going to depend more on uh, the uh, 
national agencies or international agencies like the Red Cross and other do, do wonderful work and, and they're responding, but yet the church, and it doesn't have to be that it's gotta be the huge organizations. It's the local church. That's, that's, that's where community is. That's where relationships are. And out of that context, we move and we embrace and we comfort and we demonstrate the, the reality of the message in terms of our interaction with one another. Uh, in Luke 10, this whole ministry expands. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, After this the Lord appointed 72. There's an expansion of the ministry from 12 to 72. Others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was going. He told them the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When, when you enter a house, first say peace to the house. If a man is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in the house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. When you enter a town, welcome and eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. So the ministry goes from the nine, it expands to the 12, and then by the end of the book of Matthew, which you are studying, and hopefully you'll re reach that by 2019, but, <laughs> by, <laughs> sorry, Joey. But at the end of the Matthew, it's, it's, it's the Great Commission, and again, it's an expansion of the, uh, of the mission in 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus says to his disciples that they are to what? Go into all the world and, uh, where are we here? Jesus came to them, said, all authority in heaven and on earth has given to me. Now go and keep all the commandments and make sure you let everybody know how perfect you are because you are good and you never fail and you have got perfect attendance at church reading your Bible and you're perfect. He didn't tell us to go keep commands the, the biggest command he gave us was what? To love one another. And in loving one another and loving God, if we love God, we love his commands and we live out the commands, not because we're trying to earn brownie points to get to heaven. It's because we have been approved, we have been accepted, that we want to be obedient to his commission. And he says, all authority. That's not limited. That's all authority. Not your authority, not my authority, but his authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. What did he teach us to do by way of commanding? He taught us to love one another. He taught us to be uh, servants of the king, to, to, to live in a way that will reflect the reality of the kingdom, live according to kingdom principles, live according to kingdom values. There's nothing more disturbing when we as Christians live our lives contrary to what the gospel requires that we live and we wonder why the, the, the world sometimes turns and say, what, 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 what power or truth is this message that they say they believe in when Christians many times live opposite of what the scriptures call us. So he's telling us to obey everything I command you, live in such a way that the love of Christ is obvious in your life. But he also commanded us to do other things. Love one another, serve, affirm, encourage, uh, prefer. But he also called us to pray for the sick, to cast out demons, to do all the things that he said are part of being a believer. So Jesus sends us on a mission to do the work of Jesus and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. It's an interesting uh, chapter and verse in John 12 or 14, 12. He's, he said, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now there's a lot of discussion as to what that means. Somebody's saying it's, it's, it's salvation. Well, it is salvation, but there's, there's an addition to that. And I think the greater works, in my limited ability maybe to understand this, has to be, means in, in some ways, we just don't stop there at salvation. The greater works are the inclusive works of the kingdom that go beyond our salvation. We continue to proclaim and practice and do the works of the kingdom. And Jesus sends us not 
if we go on our own ability and power, we, we will ultimately do work that brings attention to ourselves so that people can exalt so-and-so or even their ministry and what they, they're, they're doing. The reality is the only one that is to be exalted for what is done by way of the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. Not any man, not any woman. He is the one to be exalted. But we cannot be as effective as we are called to be, according to the word, without the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and, and Joby I know will be wrestling with this all week and come back to you next week. I'll probably get a few uh, Facebook messaging about it and we'll go back and forth and you know Joby usually writes me like 10 or 11 at night and he gets me all stirred up and you know I got all this stuff in my head and you know, he's fine he can he's 32 I'm going to be 68 at the end of the month he can he can go and just oh good night and I'm kind of go oh now did I say wow 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 I'm going back in church in the scripture then I go and read some other commentary and before you know I'm up till three in the morning going Joby <laughs> Sorry, Try, try at least by eight. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of like drinking, kind of like drinking decaf at my age before going to bed. You can't get to sleep because of all that stuff in your brain. You know, theological caffeine. Yeah. So it's important that we look at and, and the reality of these verses in Acts. He says we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And there's great discussion and differences in the church. What does all this mean? And sometimes it's more of a question of medicine bottle and label. The reality is, did you receive the Spirit, not only at salvation, but is the Spirit operating in your life in such a way that you are aware of, your need of, the power of God to do the work that he's called you to do? You know, I, I've been married 43 years to, to my wife by the grace of God. And uh, I mean in a powerful way, just uh, positive. <laughs> you know, because I'm so patient. You know, it's usually the opposite. But we still need the power of the Holy Spirit in our marriage. Because if God and Jesus isn't at the center and we're dealing with things, man, it, it could get to be a mess. But it's only because of our dependence upon Jesus and realizing that, you know, I can only live the Christian life and I can only be a Christian husband because of the work of the Holy Spirit in me and not on my own strength and power. When I do, I fall flat on my face and the same issues come up that I haven't dealt with or whatever. So we need the reality. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the church of Jesus Christ is, is not just an organization in the world. It's a dynamic organism that, that presents to the world, if you will, the face of Jesus Christ by our ability to reach out and be consistent with the proclamation of our message, make sure we are not the ones who are coming thinking we're bringing judgment on the world. We are the ones who are bringing the gospel, the good news that Jesus is calling us to repent, to receive the good news, and in a repentance and receiving of the good news that we can then be partakers of the blessing of the age to come. Whatever, again, that's an all-inclusive concept, which means salvation, it means healing, it means wholeness, and yes, it does mean prosperity, but within a biblical mindset and context of what prosperity is all about. And that prosperity, more than anything else, whether you're rich or you're poor, you have much or little, has more to do with contentment. If you are content in this world with whatever you have, much or little, you are a very prosperous uh, man or woman of God living for him today. Amen.